Hi, I'm Adam Pritchard, Assistant Curator of Paleontology for the Virginia Museum of Natural History, and I'm back with another tale of ancient life. And this one is with a special guest off display from the Harvest Foundation Hall of Ancient Life while the case is repaired. This skull with its lower jaws behind me is part of VMNH 120000, or VMNH 120,000. It's a specimen of a whale called Diarocetus. In addition to the skull, there's actually part of the rib cage and the backbones, and it's from the Carmel Church Quarry in Caroline County, Virginia, from rocks about 14 million years old. Now previously, actually in the first episode of Tales of Ancient Life, I talked about another whale from the Carmel Church Quarry called Eobalenoptera. Both Diarocetus and Eobalenoptera are members of a group called the baleen whales that's still with us today. These are toothless animals that instead have a hair-like substance that fills their mouths called baleen, and this allows them to filter small animals out of the water. They're called filter-feeding whales. Diarocetus lived in the same time period in the same environment as Eobalenoptera, but the skull of VMNH 120000 has a very interesting tale of ancient life to tell about its life. Note to self, find more synonyms for tale, ancient, and life. Now before I get too far into the details on the life of our whale here, I want to get into a few details of the anatomy of baleen whales, just to give you a sense of where you are on the skull. This right here is the tip of the snout. Here's the back of the whale skull here. The blowhole would have been positioned right about here. The muscles of the jaw bones would have filled these large cavities. And right here where my finger is, is the eye socket. So the whale's eye would have been positioned on the side of the skull. Again, something you see a lot in modern baleen whales. Over here you see the complete right half of the mandible in diarocetus. The bone is very, very long and skinny. There's no real strong suture that fuses the two halves of the mandibles together, which is something that exists in us and a lot of mammals. Now you might notice on the side opposite of me, small holes on the top surface of this mandible, and those actually allow the passage of the nerves and blood vessels that supplied the skin and the side of the face of diarocetus in life. The same structures can be seen in modern whale skeletons. A round part here at the back of the mandible connected it to the rest of the skull and formed the jaw joint. So this mandible over here from the right side of the diarocetus jaw is totally complete and pretty normal. But you might notice something odd about the mandible from the left side of the jaw. And that's that it's in pieces. Right about at the mid-length of the bone, it is broken into these two pieces. Now this is not because the fossil was broken during the recovery process or during the process of fossilization. This would usually result in some kind of clean breaks. When fossils snap, it really looks kind of like the shards of broken glass. There's very, very clean lines to those breaks. In this case, there's a lot of evidence that this broken jaw in two pieces was the result of an actual injury during the life of an animal. Because this is an actual record of injury or illness in the fossil record, we call this a paleopathology. So here's the front portion of the mandible. You can see those holes on the top that would have served the uh, nerves and blood vessels of this ancient whale. And then here, you can see the broken surface right here. A lot of overgrowth of bone on this animal, but still, those round cavities on the inside, those are the passages for the nerves and blood vessels. So that was still passing through this partial whale mandible, even though it was broken into two pieces. Life is resilient. Um, here's the back portion of that same mandible. Again, a lot of overgrowth of bone around the injury site. And you can see in this part, there's sort of a punky texture on the inside. This sort of irregular texture is quite common to the bone growth that occurs around injuries in modern animals. Now our diarocetus specimen, VMNH 120000, was initially analyzed by paleontologist Brian Beatty and former curator Butch Dooley in 2009, who looked at this injured specimen in multiple ways. First, they looked at the shape of the bone itself and noticed a lot of that excess growth around the broken part, suggesting that the bone, yes, did break in life, but also that it had enough time to grow and heal to some degree after the wound, possibly for weeks, even months. 
Second, they examine the injury from the inside using CT scanning to actually look inside of the fossil bone using x-ray technology. They noted that there was a lot of difference to the internal texture around the injury relative to the rest of the bone. It was thicker, denser. This is a pretty common thing in injured bones. Obviously, this animal survived while its bone was in two pieces, so why didn't it fix itself? I mean, that's one of the things that bones should be able to do. Usually, bulk and bones do fuse back together, uniting into one piece, but this is what's called a non-union fracture, where the bones begin to heal, but they never really link up again. This problem sometimes comes about because of issues with blood supply. There isn't enough blood to support the reuniting of these bones and the growth that requires that, but also it could be the result of a serious bacterial infection inside of the whale's jaw. There may have been too much inflammation for the bones to properly heal. No matter what, this diuracetus had a very rough life in the wake of this great injury, but it still managed to survive for weeks, possibly months. This whale was subject to some kind of really powerful trauma to its head, like a blunt force. Now, it's impossible to say what caused that kind of injury to an animal that's been dead for 14 million years with certainty. As Drs. Beattie and Dooley noted, there aren't any boats around at the time to run into these whales to cause injuries. A common cause for serious injuries to modern whales is collisions with boats. Could it be from another whale smashing into the head of this whale? There's not really a lot of evidence in modern baleen whales for the kind of fighting that would result in a serious trauma to the head. What about an attack by a giant predator? Ooh, that would be a cool one, wouldn't it? Unfortunately, it probably isn't that. There are gigantic megalodon sharks living at the same time as diuracetus, and they almost certainly did prey on whales, but a megalodon shark isn't going to approach a whale by smashing really, really hard into its jawbone. It's going to do biting, because that's what sharks do when they're preying on things. And other than a couple of scratch marks from parent scavenging on the carcass, there's really no evidence that this whale was ever bitten. So it looks like this whale somehow whacked into something really, really hard with a lot of force. That could have been a rock outcropping in the sea or the seabed itself. And as a result, it fractured its jaw, which is really tough for a baleen whale because opening their mouths super wide and taking in that water and filtering out the little animals is what they need in order to, to get the energy to survive. Somehow, BMNH 120000 actually managed to survive with a major injury that would have impacted its ability to, to obtain the food that it needed to stay as giant and as healthy as it was. I think a specimen like this really illustrates the amazing connections that can be made between studies of fossils and then the study of modern animals and even medical phenomena and technology to fully understand the things that we see in the fossil record. We wouldn't really understand what an injury like this massive non-union fracture to the mandible of diuracetus would be without a proper understanding of how modern whales work and how injuries to bones work in the living world. Because the living world is really the key to unveiling those tales of ancient life. For young scientists at home, here's an assignment for you. Have any of you or your family had an injury to your bones or teeth, like a broken bone, a fracture? If you have, take a look at a picture of a human skeleton and try to determine where on your body that injury would show up if you were preserved in the fossil record. Would scientists be able to understand a little bit more about your life if they were able to see that broken bone, tooth? I'm Adam Pritchard, and I'll be back with more tales of ancient life.